the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and progeny. So let's do a very quick recap of where we are just as we are about to start a new topic. The first topic that <coughs> we presented had to do with the importance of understanding what religion is and understanding the human need for religion and that became the beginning of the proof for the necessity of believing in God too. So inshallah you remember that as a kind of a, a few a series of lectures that had to do with that. So we talked for instance about how if we go back to into human history and we look at different human societies we see that one of the constants has always been religion. In other words, human beings are created in such a way that wherever you will find a human being there will always be a religion with them. Now, today we may not call whatever that is as a religion but the truth is it is a religion. So it may not be something that you the belief may not be the same one that we hold today in our religion but that set of beliefs of where we come from, uh, where are we going, what happens after death, and the rituals around that. This is stuff the human being, generally speaking, has a need for what we said, the sacred. Okay, If there is nothing in your life that's telling you what's sacred, you're going to create it yourself. <clears throat> so there was a number of lectures around that. And then from there, we slowly started going into the topic of the existence of God. And we established a number of proofs for the existence of God. One of them we called the intuitive or instinctive uh, belief in God. That's one. A second one was the more tangible one that the majority of people should uh, you know, rationally reach as a conclusion, which is simply by looking at the world that we live in and looking, uh, studying it and understanding that it has to have design. So this was generally speaking, what we presented as a proof from design. The third proof that we presented was the, uh, the proof of the necessary being. So this was a little bit more philosophical. We said one of the strengths of the proof from design is that it not only proves God, it doesn't only prove that a God exists or must exist, but it also proves a number of his attributes. You cannot just have any random type of God if you're talking specifically about the origin of design. It has to have a God with enough knowledge, with enough wisdom, with enough power, and so on and so forth to create the type of world that has the design that we're noticing, that we're seeing. And this is just what we notice and what we observe. Whereas if we go to the next proof, we said it's a solid proof. The proof of the necessary being is a strong, solid, philosophical proof. So it's less tangible, it's more philosophical, it's more abstract. It needs a bit more concentration. Um, it's a valid proof, but the problem is that it doesn't really give us a lot of attributes of God. All you can establish with it really is the necessary existence of a God. And it stops there. Everything else, you kind of have to derive it indirectly from that proof, or you have to establish it on its own, once you've established that this is a necessary being. So this is what we kind of did afterwards. So once we presented these proofs for the existence of God, we started asking the question, okay, so there is a God, but what type of God is it? A lot of people believe in a God, but today, let's say I think the majority of people I encounter may not even make a distinction between the universe and God, or, you know, the energy, or whatever they want to call it. Okay, so the pantheism, so pantheism is a belief that God and the universe are one, or that the universe itself has its own energy and somehow is will has a will and has consciousness and does something in a certain way. That's extremely pop popular nowadays. It's kind of like a a new age version of, as we said, the need for religion, right? So it's being met by this. Would that be the same thing as a higher power? Is that the higher power can be the, uh, parallel to the God? Well, you have to ask them. So when someone says the higher power, ask them, tell them, is it different from the universe or is it the universe itself? Mm -hmm. 
And so some of them will say it's the universe itself. A lot of the big scientists, a lot of the big thinkers, they believe in God, but if you ask them, really, what do you mean by God? They say it's the laws of nature. The laws of nature themselves are God. Which, you know, for us, we said, no, this is the design. You've, you've now reached the point where, that for you, there's absolutely no doubt that there's design. There's an intelligence required. There is a purpose here. It does something as opposed to nothing. If any of these laws were different, existence would not exist, right? Like that's, the, when we talked enough about this from mathematicians, from phys- uh, physicists and others, books like Just Six Numbers and other books like that, they talk really about this. There are constants, there are formulas and equations that if any of them were a little bit different, matter could not come together, or, or, or. Okay, so all of that brings us to them, a lot of them thinking the laws themselves are God. But we have a problem with that because we're asking where did it come from? Where did these laws come from? And we re-encountered that later, right? So once we talked about all of this, we wanted to see what type of God is it that we're talking about. And that's why we started talking about the attributes of God. We said we believe in God and we believe that this is a God that has knowledge, that has power, that has will, that, uh, and it's a free will, but he doesn't use it randomly, so he has wisdom. And we talked about all of that, and we explained the difference between the will of God, there's a legislative will, and there's a existential will. So existential means it happens, and that's it. It basically means his act of creation. If he wills something, it is. Or there is the legislative will, which is a law that he puts in place, but he doesn't force you. Okay, so that's a difference. So, and then we talked about the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember that. So we said the lordship is basically that the one who takes care of the world. And then you have the, 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 the divinity of God, al-uluhiyya. And that is where, after all of this is said, then you say, therefore, this is the type of entity, a type of God that is worthy of being worshipped. Right? Not any type of God is worthy of worship. So this brings us to Uluhiyya. And then Uluhiyya has different meanings, Rububiyya has different meanings, we went through all of that. When we put all of that together, now we have a pretty good idea of, one, there is a God, He exists necessarily, and this is a type of God that we have in mind. All of this was to answer the question, the first question we said every human being should have three existential questions around which his entire life is built. And everything else comes out of this, derives out of this. Those, the answers to these three questions, they form your worldview. And a lot of people, and the majority of people, they have not consciously thought about these questions. One of the benefits of religion and religious thought, and you know, a gathering like this, where we talk about this, is to force ourselves to think about these questions in a more conscious manner. Basically, we're saying everybody is going through this, but they're not realizing it. So, at least in your case, when you're conscious of it, you're doing it with your eyes wide open. You understand what you're doing. Every, que- every human being, once they reach a certain level of maturity in life, they are trying to understand their origin, and this is something ingrained and wired in all of us. That's why human beings spend so much time studying the past. We want to know where we come from. Why is this fascination with where we come from? And a lot of people who study aliens, it's, this is the reason. A lot of people who study the theory of evolution, this is the reason. A lot of people, it's because we want to understand how we got here. We want to understand our origin. To a certain extent, this is what we're doing by studying God, by exploring the notion of God, right? That's one. Where do we come from? This question of origin. The next question is the destination. Where are we going? What's going to happen? Obviously, everything you look at around you in life, you see everything is ending. Human beings, every single person you know, dies. So at least in theory, you know you're going to die too. So then you have to ask your question, your yourself. What happens when I die? Is everything over? Does it just go blank and I no longer exist? Which is an extremely difficult thought, extremely depressing and miserable thought. 
And there are entire philosophies in the world over history that have been built with this idea. That there's nothing that happens after death. Therefore, anything goes. In very recent times, they're now trying to re-establish value, meaning in life, without necessarily having something after death. This is very recent. Again, we talked a little bit about this. We said how atheists are trying to create a moral code. They're trying to convince themselves and everybody else that even though there is no heaven and hell and there is no God and nothing happens after you die, for some reason you're still supposed to live a good life. And you're supposed to sacrifice and you're supposed to help and you're supposed to... If you say this is a utilitarian, in the sense that, let's say if you don't do it, something happens to you, I understand. Right? So, you know, you break a law, you get caught. Oh, okay, so something might happen to you. But what if you don't get caught? What if you're a way, you're, you have a way to do whatever you want to do and there's no repercussion to you in this life? You can kill, you can rape, you can steal, you can... If, it, if you can really do that without any repercussions to you and there's no anything that happens after death, you die and that's it. So what would prevent you from doing whatever you feel like doing in this world? Usually the thing that prevents human beings is the moral code, is their morality. It's wired within us. But the morality, does it just stop as being a moral code just because? Or is there supposed to be something associated with it? And if you do the wrong thing enough, it stops being the wrong thing. Right? And that even goes to some, something like killing. The first time you do it, it's horrible. Maybe the hundredth time you do it, it's no longer really carrying that kind of impact on you, the trauma on you. So, anyways, we talked about this entire morality and moral code. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. To say that, as we said, very recent, very modern notion that people are saying... Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That people seem to try to at least find a way, philosophers and big thinkers are trying to come up with a moral system regardless of what happens after we die. But generally speaking, let's say 99.9% .9 of people, depending on what happens after you die, you're not going to live the same life. Whether something is good or bad, to you really what matters is after you die. This, is the, this becomes the ultimate criteria. For me to do or not to do, I need to know what, what happens after death. Is there a possibility that what I'm doing here can translate into something eternal or not? If it, all that happens is if there's harm here, it's only harm here and that's it. And if there's good here, it's only good here and that's it. It's completely different than saying... It may look like it's good here, but it's actually an eternal harm. Or something that looks like it's harmful here, but it's actually an eternal good. And that changes the equation completely. Yes? Yeah, I just to say, uh, like with the moral code, uh, the difference between somebody that believes in an afterlife and somebody that doesn't, I feel like their genuineness gets affected. Because sometimes I feel like some people you can kind of like see through them like they're there it feels so fake but is, is that typically a general like uh something you can gen paint generally uh or it has nothing to do with uh, it's a really good question yeah. it was asked a few times yeah over the past few months we've asked that question um and there's different ways to answer it and i will answer it but give me an example uh so like like you see uh in general, like with uh, like, there's always like these charities with helping uh, helping poor people in Africa or helping dogs with three legs or something like that. <laughs> uh, it's like uh, like there's this like initiative to be good people, but I just I just don't see the genuineness of it because like realistically, it's like caring for a dog is nice, but there are people let's say that are hungry, right? So like there's that comes first type of thing if we're talking in that spectrum and then in terms of like uh, 
like feeding people in Africa, it feels more like a, like a, it's a, there's, it goes deeper, but like a more of a, like a, just a handout than it is, like these people have resources themselves, rather than showing them how to use their resources, it's kind of like, let me take your resources and here's some, uh, some, some uh, handout back type thing. But I don't know, that's, that's what I see, but like, uh, I just feel like it's ungenuine, like those whole, like those movements of like, uh, but that could be just my view of it. Yeah. Okay, so the way you, you put it makes it more complicated to answer. I was hoping it would be simpler than that. Um, and the way you presented it, I think, is a little problematic. So we have to di distinguish between a few things. Um, so if someone, let's say, is you know trying to help the three-legged dog, versus a human being and they're distracted by the dog for whatever reason that's just a matter of priorities okay so if you live in a messed up uh, value system where you can't see that a human being's life is more important than a dog's life uh you know that's that's one thing that's one problem and it has its causes and whatever so that's not an intention issue right then the second thing was you said maybe someone who is let's say helping someone in Africa so at least this person has seen that the person is more important than the dog. You said that it could be more of a handout, and you're you're taking their resources from one side and you know giving them a handout on the other. Yeah. It doesn't have to be generally the person themselves, but like in a general. Culture. Yeah. So if it's that's why I was gonna say, yeah. you know, it it may be that you're criticizing the system. Yeah. Okay, there's a system in place and it perpetuates itself this way, fine, but that's not an intention issue either. Because the person giving the handout and helping the person in Africa may actually have, they are really trying to help the person in Africa. So you can't really come back and say their intentions are not pure. You, you may take out money from your wallet and say, this is for the orphan in my country, and they're taking money from their pocket with the same intention and saying, this is for the, I don't know, orphan or poor person in Africa. So you see that there, it's not a problem of intention in this sense. They're both genuine. Does it mean that those two acts are the same? This is your question, yeah. right? So two people doing the act, because everything else obviously makes it unequal as an act. Yeah. But two people, so you and this person are taking the same amount from your wallet with the same genuineness. You feel bad for this person, you take money. and The short answer, because this is a huge topic, the short answer is no, it's not the same. Because you can't look at the act on its own. Your act stems from an entire system, from an entire belief system, and this act is a part of that. It perpetuates, it keeps that system going, that ide ideology, that worldview, and this is an act as part of that worldview. And in their world, their act is part of their worldview. And that's why in our religion we say, we have to nail down the worldview first, and then I can tell you what's the worth of every action in there. An action on its own doesn't carry any weight. It may look like it's a good action. It may look like the person is praying or the person is helping someone else. That's on the outside. But this is not what God is looking at. It's as though you're building an actual thing with your action. To build it, you need the right tools. You need the... Everybody else might be tricked because in appearance this is what it looks like. It looks like this is what you're doing. If you're not, the action is not stemming from a belief system, then why are you helping this person? Is it really, do you believe in God or not? Do you believe in an afterlife or not? You saw that someone is getting hurt in front of you. So you have a high sensitivity. So it causes you harm and it causes you pain to see someone there. So you want to remove your own pain. So you'll take out some money or you feel bad. So out of guilt, you take out some money and you help them. This is a completely different, deeper intention than the person who says it be, does it because you say, God has said that you help everyone you can in society. And there's a whole system and you're perpetuating that system. Whereas the other one is most likely, as you said, perpetuating the system that I will steal resources from you here and I will have some people get, give you back there. Yeah. Okay, but in this case, if you're doing it because God said it's good to do it, yeah. does that remove from the act itself because you care less about the person you care more about pleasing God yeah and I thought his question was that okay. 
So if someone does the act, so two people, no, now we resolved that one. So what we're saying is that there's a minimum of a belief system that you have to have. You have to believe in God. You have to believe in an afterlife. You have to believe that there's a right and wrong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects you to behave in a certain way as His servant. If you have that minimum, that changes the meaning of every act you do. And this is why we always say, so make sure that you're aware of that. You are behaving in appearance. It looks like you're doing the same thing as the person who doesn't believe. Make sure that you don't live your life this way. Don't waste your life because you look like you're eating and that person looks like they're eating. And you look like you're studying and that person looks like they're studying. And you look like you're working or working out or entertaining yourself. And they look like they're doing that too. But the truth is, if you understand the deeper meaning of our religion, the truth is it's not. But the only way to ensure that it's not is that you're always aware that it's not. You're always aware that your act is supposed to make you a better servant. Your act is an act of servitude to God. But if you're not aware of that, you're completely distracted by good luck. You know, I, I don't know how to help you with that. I'm telling you, someone, when they have the intention, when they, as part of the belief system, that's what it's supposed to be. You are a better servant because you take care of yourself. You are a better servant because you sleep and you eat and you study and you work. And so all of this gets a new meaning. Then someone who is going through these motions because they have animal impulses and biological needs and you know social needs and cultural needs and whatever. These are two completely different ways of living your life. One of them, the act falls under there. And one of them, the act falls here. Okay? Now, your question was, two people are doing the same thing. One of them does it because he believes that this is the right thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to do. And the other one does it blindly just because Allah said to do it, so I do it, end of story. Okay? Another person, let's add a few more in there. It's going to be a party. The first person? Yeah, it's like kind of... A, person A, let's make it easier. We, we make it into a gradation. Person A, he doesn't know right, wrong, whatever. God says, I do, end of story. Okay? That's one. Person two, it's not about God said or God didn't say. It's if I do this, I go to heaven. And if I do this, I go to hell. That's second type. A third person says, and this is all an act of worship, I do this because these are acts of worship. Right? There's an expectation of me to live in a certain way, and I live in that way. Not because there's a law, and not because there's going to be a punishment or a reward. Because it's the right thing to do that's worthy of me, and my place in the universe, and being a servant of God. So the question is, when those three people are doing the exact same act... Is it the exact same act and value as well, as an appearance or not? Yes. And the short answer is no, it's not. Oh, in, appearance. in appearance it is, exactly. In appearance it's the exact same act. But because of that intention, it becomes completely different. So the first person, they're doing it just because it's a law. I follow the law blindly and I don't care. And those people are usually, are usually referred to as al-abid. Someone who does this a lot. Usually that's abid. I follow blindly. I'm told if you do this, you get this tawab. Good, that's it. I'm, I'm supposed to do that and I do it. End of story. And there's a person who's looking at a deeper meaning for this. The second person, before the, the, the deeper meaning, the second person is doing it not just because it's a blind law that they follow. They went a little bit deeper and they said, but I get something good out of this. Or I avoid something really bad out of this. So either I avoid hell, whether it's punishment in this world or the next, and we talked about that, so now we can talk about it. And we said everything that we do, 
we do taste it in this life. So some people even don't even go in the afterlife. They stop here. And they say, if I'm good to my parents, I'm going to have children who are good to me. And if I'm good to my parents, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to extend my life in this world. So that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. If there was something wrong with that, then I wouldn't have been told by my religion. Right? Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me this is an incentive. So that's a good thing. No issue with that. This is going a little bit further than I just do because that's the law and I don't care. I just do blindly. This is what I want. I'm a machine. You, you think like that person, A, uh, their intentions are kind of uh, mirroring those of, uh, of an atheist uh, because most likely they, they're only following the law because they live in a social construct that, and, uh, that imposes this law and they're just following that social And it could very well be that. As an atheist person. And it could very well be that. Bad example, I know, but I'm going to give it still. Hatta we think about it deeply to every aspect of our lives. You know, if you're in Iraq, Arba'iniya comes, the 40th of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, the expectation is that everybody goes walking. So you go walking. You don't know what you're doing, where you're going, what it means, but you are part of a society where this is the norm. You do it. Is there anything wrong with it? Does it have any meaning or not? Oh, you have to now drill down and see where is it coming from. I'll give you an... Yes. Another example would be when the Imam uh, walked into uh, Mecca and he saw the, a lot of hadith. And he said, Oh, my Akhtar of Dajid, you Akhtar of Hadith. It's just a... Noise. <laughs> it's just noise. It's just dust and noise and no one is really performing the pilgrimage. This is not pilgrimage. Just walking around the Kaaba is not the pilgrimage. Walking between Safa and Marwa, that's not pilgrimage. Wearing the Ihram is not the pilgrimage. You're completely missing the point. Okay, so that's the second one. So sometimes there are people who at least go, so that was the first category. The second category, there are people who are looking a little bit beyond that, but they're actually looking at the utilitarian aspect. So it's all about what harm am I avoiding and what benefit am I getting? And so there's benefits in this world and benefits in the next. There's harms in this world and there are harms in the next. And I would say that the great majority of people, they fall here. Right? So they say, they say in some of our ruwayat, they say that there are people who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear of hell. And this is the worship of the slaves. And this is not the slave, the word slave used in a good way. This is not like you're a servant of God and you understand. This is the worship of someone who knows their place. You know, and the only way to make you work, the only way to incentivize you, the only way to motivate you in life, you don't have a lot of, you know, mental capacity to actually understand the meaning of things. It's not intellectual, by the way. The mental capacity I'm talking about is spiritual, Okay. Someone who understands right and wrong has nothing to do with education or you understand why you're here. And you have an inner goodness in your heart that makes things clear to you. Okay? Someone who only sees that, only will only do or not do because there's hell, the ruayat refers to these people as slaves. So they're trying to say there is something better than just being a slave. So long as there's a whip, you do. If the whip is not there, you stop. Okay, well, it's a good thing that the whip is always there. We are told in our narrations, too, that on the Day of Judgment, there are groups of believers, Yom al qiyamah that when they are supposed to be brought to heaven, they force themselves to go towards hell. And the angels led them. And so they go towards hell, but it's not to get inside. Because people are wondering what's going on. They say they go and they walk all the way to the doors or the wall of hell and they kiss it. And they tell hell, if it were not for you, we would not be going to heaven. Okay, so you can see there are people, and I think that's for the majority of us at least, we will fall under there, right? You do because you're afraid of hell. I don't think it's anything bad to be honest. Absolutely not. And that's why I'm saying, so I'm going to say everything I'm saying, but I'm going to come back. 
and say, no, let's not be arrogant and think we can just jump into being like the highest level of spirituality right away. Let's meet the minimum. Let's try to meet the minimum first and then we'll talk. Okay, let's ensure we have the minimum. So let's say the minimum is I do the right things because I'm afraid of hell. That's good. That's great. It means I saved my life. The Quran says those who have been able to be extracted from hell, they have won greatly. It's like pulling teeth. Okay? Whoever has been able to be extracted from hell, you extract yourself from hell. And who shoved into heaven, فقد فاز. So this is this is the minimum. It's basically you just rescued yourself from hell. Good. That's level one. That's slave. That's the worship of slavery. Slaves. You're afraid. You are motivated by fear. Good. That's why Allah put fear in you. And that's why He keeps telling you about fear. It's there for a reason. But there is more to aspire to. There are people who are more motivated, not by fear of hell, but with the good things and the benefits and everything else and the pleasures and the desires that are met in heaven. So now it becomes a full transaction. I transact with God. I'm a merchant. God is selling something and I'm buying something. I'm buying the pleasures of heaven with my worship. I'm buying the comforts of heaven, the luxuries of heaven. Okay, that's good. That's why the hadith says, and those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of love and out of desire for heaven, this is the worship of the merchants. Ibadat al-Tujjar. He's in a transaction with God. Has he missed the point? Yes, a little bit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not an, you know, a, a merchant like you and two businessmen doing a deal. Okay, I do this and I get this in return. Good. But that's how you're dealing with it. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful enough to let it go. They'll say, fine, and I accept you and all your worship, and here's everything you worked for. Here's the heaven you were looking for. You bought all of this with good acts and with your good work, so I'll give it to you. And then there are those who, no, no, their eyes are on God. And their heart is towards God. And this is why the big philosophers and the big thinkers and the big scholars, they say they're in a love relationship with God. They love God. When you love someone, you want to please them. When you love someone, you want to impress them. I'm not doing it because I'm afraid. It's not because of hell. Even if hell was not there, I would still do it. Because I want to impress you. I want you to see what I'm willing to do for you. Right? Like this is... And this is at the level of a human being. So imagine these people who really start understanding God. So it's not about heaven and it's not about hell. It becomes about God. And this is how, this is what allows us to understand the words of Imam Ali alayhi salam. We understand this like in Dua Kumayr where he, he says, even if you were to take me because I have sinned and if you were to take me and throw me in hell. I would still ask for your mercy because I know who you are. I would never cut my hope out of you because I know who you are. He's talking to God. This is a completely different type of addressing God than someone who's like, get me out of here. What are you doing? Why are you burning me? Right? He's in a love relationship with God. It's like, I don't care. If I deserve this, fine. This does not mean that I stop loving you. And it does not mean that I cut my hope in you. Or he says in, uh, elsewhere in some of his narrations, I have not worshipped you, O God. I swear that I have not worshipped you out of fear of your hell. Nor have I worshipped you out of desire for your heaven. But I have worshipped you because I have found you worthy of worship, so I worshipped you. This is completely different. He's not looking at the heaven and hell. He's looking at God. His entire attention, his entire focus is God. The more I understand God, the more I interact with him accordingly. And this is the part that ihna, we, we have to try. This is dhikr. The Quran talks so much about dhikr. This is dhikr. It's being in constant awareness of what God is and what kind of relationship you're supposed to have with him. The more you're in that, the Quran says, the more you are at peace. You live your life at peace. Your eyes are on God. No matter what happens around you, until you're at peace. You go through life and you're not even distracted by things like heaven and hell. 
But how many people can fall in that category? You know, it's the category of Imam Ali alayhi salam. So we know what we can aspire to. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says the greatest thing that a human, human being can have is the satisfaction of Allah. That God is actually happy with you. Of course, now in this world, when we say it, it's kind of difficult. We have to go back and really think about this. What it, does it mean? Okay? In the afterlife, this is going to be clear. Everybody will feel it. You will feel if you have the satisfaction and how much. And this is the difference between the afterlife and this world. Is that all these things, they're just words in this world. And the next world, they're realities. The whole, the next world is only made up of these realities that you actually live. You experience them. Here, they're, theor- they're ideas, they're words, they're abstract notions, concepts. So you have to sit and think. So if you want the greatest thing, you're that type of human being, you aim for the greatest thing that you can have. The Quran talks all over the place with what's awaiting those who avoid hell and the benefits and the pleasures and the desires and all the good things that come out of going into heaven. Beautiful. But then the Quran says, in one verse it says, uh, عنهم عنه. Wow, those are because who? The beginning of that verse says, or right after it says, It's not just anybody who gets to the station of beyond heaven and hell and they know that God is happy with them. Your teacher at school may be really happy with you because you got A plus on the exam. Or you pass, but you pass with a D plus. You passed. Good. You're not flunking. He won't see your face again next semester. You passed. But with a D plus. Well, you're obviously not the same as the A plus student. There's a satisfaction. That person got a satisfaction. And in the afterlife, here it, we may say it doesn't mean anything. In the afterlife, it will mean something. We will all see it. We will see that this is the, the grand prize. We're all there in line. We're like chopped liver. <laughs> and, and there standing and watching some people get the grand prize. And we know that it was within our reach, all of us. All of us could have gotten it. But they're the only ones who got the satisfaction part. Right? So some of them, the Qur'an says, عنهم They are happy with God, and God is happy with them. And another verse, it says, it talks about those who go to heaven and everything that awaits them. And it says, And greater than all of that, وَرِضْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرٌ And the satisfaction of God for those are, is greater than everything that we described. And we have narrations, and inshallah we'll talk about that when we'll talk about the afterlife soon, once we're done with prophethood. We have narrations that tell us that there are people in this world, heaven is more looking forward to them coming into it than they are going into heaven. We have a narration from the Holy Prophet, he talks about Salman al-Farisi, Salman al-Muhammadi. He says, الجنة أشوق إلى سلمان من سلمان إلى الجنة. Heaven is will be more happy that Salman finally comes into Jannah than Salman is going to be happy going into the Jannah. يعني basically the rank of Salman as an existence as an entity is higher than the level of Jannah. In our world, this completely changes the notions. There's a verse in the Quran that talks about people who are good, and it says it's a very interesting word. The terminology of the Quran is very accurate and forces you to think a lot. It talks about good people and it says, Hum darajatun indallah. It doesn't say they are going to be. So, some interpreters they say they are going to be put. So, it's called an ellipsis. So, the words are not all mentioned, okay? Hum darajatun and Allah, it's like hum yadkhuluna fi darajatin or something like that, right? So the words are not all mentioned, it's implied that they are going to be in different levels. These are all good people, but they're not all at the same level. So they're going to be entering 
to God, close to God in heaven, they will be in different ranks. But if you take the verse as it's saying it, the words, the words are actually saying, Hum darajatuna. They are ranks. Each one of us is a rank. If you understand that you are a rank, then you understand it changes. It's not just words when you say, Yom Al-Qiyamah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells people whatever you learned from the Qur'an, read and go up. This is you. This is what you're carrying inside of you. You are going to be put in your rank because you are a rank. Every human being has become their own rank. Okay, well I did a huge detour to come back to the question of the intention. It's because the intention is who you are. The knowledge you carry, the awareness you have, the actions you do, if you put them together, this is the package of who you are. Remove the body, and all that's left of you is your knowledge, the actions you did, and your intentions. All the stuff that you don't see. Right? This is what's left. This, if you take it together, you can put any package on it, but the, the reality is this is who you are. And the reality is this is this entity is what's going to be a rank Yom al Okay, anyways. So let's go back to our topic. Good question. So we said that in very recent times there has been a push by people who are more on the atheist and anti-religion side who have tried to create a moral system or argue that even though there is no belief in God, there is no belief in heaven, there is no belief in hell, there is still a way to live a good life and to be a good person without any of that. Okay, But this is very recent. Traditionally in humanity, people who have rejected God, it has gone together hand in hand with philosophies of pessimism. And this is where the terms actually came from. And you have very big thinkers like Friedrich Nietzsche and others who openly created philosophies based on this. It's kind of like an atheistic existentialism and humanism and, and, and. Well, he was completely against religion, institutional religion and, and morality. He does not believe in morality. I, it's, it's very difficult because he wrote a lot and he's a very complex no, thinker. Just because of his like, philosophy of uh, God is dead, I thought he's not an atheist. Well, that's what he's saying. God is dead. So he has been replaced by human Bro. beings. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it's not like the way he's saying it, it's not like... Uh, uh, from what I understand, I didn't read the whole thing, but like, uh, uh, he's not saying like, like talking about God himself, but like, uh, like God, like, uh, people are acting like God isn't there anymore, uh, in that sense. Yeah. That's what I understood from that. Yeah, so who is talking about religion and the place of religion in society? Yeah. Um, but he's not criticizing. Who or what he wants is for people to live in the strongest way possible. And one of the ways you, you, you destroy that or you break that is by imposing a religion on them. So the biggest culprits in society are people like Christians. Because you've imposed a religion on them, they live like slaves. And who he wants people to live like superhumans. So the superhuman is the one who has will and arrogance and who will be aggressive and who will go get whatever he wants and so on and so forth. Anyways, that's a good topic that we'll keep inshallah one day and We'll talk about Friedrich Nietzsche. And it's very interesting that they teach Nietzsche even in moral <laughs> classes, moral <laughs> philosophy classes, yeah. when his whole philosophy is against morality and against religion and against God. But anyways. So we said, we covered the need for religion. We covered the existence of God. We covered the attributes of God. And from there we moved into the big topic of evil in the world. And this is kind of to close the loop on the attributes of God. One of the attributes of God, as we said, this ha is also a just God. A God that not, does not commit injustice against his creatures. So we gave kind of two big answers. One answer was the relative evil in the world, as opposed to the absolute evils. And the other answer was the detailed answer which we gave, and where we said, it's not as simple as that. Let's actually look into different acts and see where they fall. When we talk about evil in the world, what does it mean? 
and we said there's a difference between something that is a moral wrong and something that is harmful, and really, really the problem with the majority of people is that they have what? They have an issue with what is harmful. And what is harmful is either as a test, or to make you better, or to make someone else better, but there's a compensation for it, or it's a punishment. Right? These are the big answers that we gave. In there, because we were also talking about worldview, we also spent a little bit of time talking about the materialist worldview. And so we talked about the general principles of materialism. And then, because it's an important topic, we said we're going to look at three examples of materialist thought and the issues with it. So we looked at the problem of, or the question of, how did the universe begin from a materialist point of view? We looked at the problem of how did life emerge from a materialist point of view? And we looked at, are human beings the same or different as the rest of creation from a materialist point of view versus non-materialist point of view? Okay, so we covered those, so keep all of that in mind. So the next topic that we are just now about to start, with all of this, just so that we situate ourselves, what we're doing, and I want you guys to be in the future, I can't be the one doing this recap. So someone has to be able to tell this, this is a story, right? Where, so now we have enough points, and we have enough um, topics covered to start seeing that there's a story being told here. So now that we know that there is an origin and a source and a worldview, we have a certain worldview, we have a certain way of understanding the world and understanding our experience of the world because we believe in a God, right? So we answered the first question, kind of. Where do we come from? Now the second question is one of two. Either we ask the question, where are we going? The destiny, the end result. Or we ask the question, what are we doing here? We could equally ask either or of the questions. They're both valid. And logically, we can ask any of them. Traditionally, in classic aqaid classes, they ask the question, what are we doing here first? So that's what we're going to do. What are we doing here is the question that is usually answered by the word of Nubuwa. The heading, the title of Nubuwa. Where are we going is the answer given usually by one word, which is Ma'ad, the afterlife. So now where we're at, that there is a God, there is an origin, there is an expectation from this God, because he has certain attributes. He behaves in a certain way and expects us to behave in a certain way. Now we open the topic of Nubuwa. We open the topic of prophethood. So, what are the big questions about prophethood? What is the need for prophethood? Yani why are we talking about this topic at all? In another way, it's going to become that question once we delve into it. What is the necessity of prophethood? When we look at prophethood, we're going to see that it splits into two big parts. One part is the message, which is usually referred to as wahi or revelation. So we have to spend a little bit of time understanding what is wahi. What do we mean by wahi? And why do we need it? And we're going to link that to human knowledge. The limits of human knowledge. And then the other part of that equation of Nubuwa is the person carrying the message. The prophet. So what if someone claims to be a prophet? How do I know that they are really a prophet or not? How do I, what do I expect from someone if they are a prophet? What do I need them to be? How do I expect them to behave? And how do I establish that they are truly a prophet or not? So this will force us to talk about one topic, which is miracles. Miracles are going to be the main way to establish the validity of the claim 
When someone says, I'm a prophet, we're going to say, prove it. Answer, miracles. So that opens the topic of miracles. And on the other side, I have to be able to look at this person who is claiming to be sent from God and see what is the purpose. Why is God sending people to human beings? Why is He not revealing everything to everyone? Why is He not just putting it in a book or in a tablet somewhere or whatever, however He wants to download it into us? And then I don't need to go through other people to get it. So obviously there's a point for having it in people. So what do I expect from those people? And this is going to open the topic of Asma, infallibility. Why do prophets and messengers, why do we say that they are infallible or not? And then we're going to go through some of the stories that we know, the narrations, or some of the stories that we see in the Holy Quran, and we see how it seems in appearance that they are doing things that contradict the notion of infallibility. That is not compatible with infallibility. So how do we explain that? Okay? All of these topics that we talked about, yes, they do have to do with prophethood. And as we said, prophethood is now split between two. So there's the revelation part. And what does it mean? Where does it come from? What do we do with it? What ensures that the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to communicate to people is actually the same message that I heard? That's one side. The other side is looking at these people who are supposed to be carrying the message and looking at their traits and looking at what allows me to ensure that this is actually someone sent from God and in other cases I'm going to say, no, this is a false claim. This is not someone sent by God. What's my criteria? All of that, when I put it together, this topic is half of what is discussed in Nubuwa. Okay, why half? Because usually nubuwa, prophethood, is split into two big parts. You are either talking about these questions that I just asked, this is the first half, you're talking about the questions and the topics that apply to all prophets. So understanding revelation, understanding prophets, and everything under there, we need that to understand any prophet. It applies to all prophets. Prophet Nuh, Prophet Ibrahim, Prophet Yusuf, Prophet Musa, all of them, I need the, these topics in place first before I drill down into this or that specific topic, uh, this or that specific prophethood, this or that specific prophet. I need to establish first, is there something like a revelation from God to human beings or not? Does it even make sense to say that this God that we talked about actually talks to human beings? He has something to tell them or not? And why? And why is it done in this way? And when it's done, and it's done through someone, how do I know that this someone is actually a prophet versus someone who is, you know, a psychopath with some mental instability, who's claiming to be talking to God? As you probably would find 50 of them in downtown right now. God told me, right? So how do I distinguish between these two? How do I know that this person is actually sent from God and I can rely on them? Once I know this, then I go into the second half of prophethood as it is usually studied. And this is where you study the prophethood of every prophet on their own. So now you study everything related only to that prophet. So the prophethood of Prophet Adam السلام, is obviously going to be different from the prophethood of Prophet Isa or Prophet Muhammad Each one of them was sent at a different time. Each one of them was given a different miracle. Each one of them seemed to have been carrying something different or variable in their message to their people. Each one of them faced specific challenges that they had to overcome. Right? So if you want to study that as a specific topic related to this or that prophet, this is usually called the Nubu al khassa special prophethood or specific prophethood as it relates to this or that prophet. Now my question to you, so what we're going to be doing next over the few weeks, next few weeks, is to cover Nubu al am Okay, we need that. that, there's no question about that. So we're going to talk about the need for revelation, 
what does it mean to need religion, what do we expect from prophets, what are their characteristics, infallibility included, what's a miracle and why do we need it, and how do we establish that it's actually a miracle, all of that. This is Nubu'a Am. We're going to do that over the next few weeks.